All right. Well, let's start for week seven then, the church. So this week, uh, we'll go through theologically what the church is and then what it looks like and living it out. Uh, but before we, we get into the content just yet, let's, let's do our, our brainstorming, kind of aware of what presuppositions, what ideas we're bringing to the table, what's out there in the world. What do people in our day and age and culture think when they hear uh, about the church or hear the word church? Okay, good. Cult, antiquated. For the week. For the week. Okay, expand on that. Uh, I feel that a lot of people's um, argument is that people go to a church for believing God. It's, it's, they're not strong enough on their yeah. own. Yeah, okay. Um, for, so we'd say weak-minded or emotionally uh, handicapped or something. Yeah. Okay. Oppressive. Oppressive. Expand on that. Um, I think kind of just like people who they grew up in church and just felt like they couldn't live the lives, like worldly lives that they would like, don't want to. Okay. Oppressive because of certain rules. Yeah. Rules. That's what I thought we were saying. Rules. Okay. Um, and like with that, it sounds like you're kind of saying it's manipulative. Is that right? Okay. On that note, I would say I'm like a, a far out there would be um, the, the money side of it. Like oh, know, yeah. Okay. Um, just after money. Yeah. Corporate mentality. Uh, okay. It, what do you mean by that? Uh, oh, the, just the, the money concept, um, uh, the idea that like the Catholic Church is the largest corporation in the world. Okay. They're not really out for... Um, quote unquote saving people as much as they are for you know making a dollar be a business. So okay. They are the largest landowners. They are the largest. <laughs> uh, largest corp and landowners. That's interesting. And also like the baggage of it, so you have, you know, Puritan earning which is at the stake and purification through the Crusades. Salem Witch Trials, the Spanish Inquisition, we're still winning numerically against, you know, atheism with Mussolini and Hitler and Stalin. <laughs> they killed more. <laughs> A terrible argument. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I don't even. I'm not sure if it's in your materials in the book. I'll have to look. But um, I have a um, an apologetic study on that uh, opposition to Christianity. That's like, okay, well, what about these things? And so the basic argument that I present in there is, it's somebody stealing the name of Jesus, the name of Christian, and doing evil things in in his name. Like if somebody stole a tractor with uh, that was a brand caterpillar on the side and went and bulldozed somebody's house. It's not caterpillar's fault that they did it, you know. Um, so that's the essential uh, apologetic that goes with that. Yeah. What else, you guys? The church. You guys are you guys are on it with this one. I mean, late, lately, uh, you know, in the media and stuff, we're haters. We're bigots. Yeah. <laughs> haters and bigots. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, what when you say that when culture thinks church worshipers, what do they think? It's like what is it something that you do on Sundays, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. Isn't just a I mean the primary when people oh, think about church, oh it's just something that you go to. Sunday. Yeah. So then it's a an event. What is it? They call it the Sunday morning worshipers or something? Sure. Yeah. Weekend Warrior? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard that before, but that's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you guys want to throw on this fire? A few years ago, I remember there was like a Newsweek, uh, this is during the Bush administration, but that there was claims about the, the power of the evangelicals in yeah. national politics. And, and, but now it's uh, almost the opposite. You see a lot of news articles about uh, 
the rising number of Americans who identify as non-religious and how yep. the church is collapsing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, got some Marxism in here. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, studying things and knowing those things is helpful. Even if you're just like, yeah, that's Marxist. Yeah, like, we don't believe that. But like, oh, wow, you guys are actually smart. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> It's actually a Puritan practice of anticipating a, like somebody's objection and then answering their objection before they can present it. So, yeah. It's a good tool in preaching. <laughs> uh, yeah. You might be thinking this, but that is crazy. <laughs> Says the preacher. <laughs> yeah. All right. Wow. Not too great of, I mean, <laughs> kind of looks like the church sucks. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and a lot of it's true, man. Uh, a church is made up of sinners. And I think that's the beauty that, that Jesus loves the church, his bride. Spots, wrinkles, blemishes, and all, um, despite all those things. And yet he's doing something powerful in and through it. And so that's what we want to look at this week with... Uh, our material. So, we get caught up to where we are in the book. We're at page. Anybody know what page we're on? Thank you. All right. So, um, when you look at the the church and in, in the Bible, you've got a, a number of different uh, metaphors and references to the church and ways to conceive of it um, because it's 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 a big deal. And, and so the Bible tries to come at it from a number of different angles to help us understand what this thing called the church is. So one, you know, here's a definition uh, that I give. The, the Greek word is ekklesia. Ek means out. Klesia is a, a, uh, is a calling, comes from the, the Greek word kaleo. And so it's to be called out is the picture that we are, we're called out of in the book of First Peter. says called out of darkness and into his wonderful light. And so the church is the, pe the called people of God. Uh, it's the eternal community of all true believers. When it comes to the metaphors, we've got the bride. I just mentioned that one, um, that Jesus is the husband, the church is his bride. Uh, it's, a, it's a mystery. Now, um, in Ephesians 5, I'll, I'll read this for you. It says that husbands are to love the wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Um, and, and then he says... Um, He's talking about those those roles, and and he says, um, no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and church just as Christ does the church, because we are all members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's a quote of Genesis, right? And then he says, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Interesting. So, what's the mystery? Is the mystery like something that we can't understand? The Greek word for mysterion is actually something that wasn't known before, but then has been made revealed. What Paul's arguing here is that way back in, in Genesis, when God formed the, the, the very nature of what marriage is, the very first marriage, he did it, it's a time mystery, looking forward in time to when he would send his son to die in perfect love for his bride. That the very essence of marriage is based upon the way that Jesus uh, looks and feels and acts towards his bride, the church. Pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. um, when I do premarital counseling, I always like go there. I'm like, man, that's why you need Jesus as the center of your marriage, because that's actually at the very heart of what a marriage is. Um, the 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 what's the oldest sort of conception of, of the church is that is the, or the organic metaphor that it's a body, so it's a comparison analogy with our own physical body. So you have that in Ephesians too, just the previous chapter says that there's there's many parts of the body, you know. So there's an arm, there's a leg, there's a head, and that's Jesus, you know, um, that we all have a part. When each part is working properly, then the body grows and builds in love. And we grow up into him who is the head. And so that's really, if you wanted to take a, um, a snapshot picture of what our hearts desire, how we would live as the church together, is to be members of a body where we would each work together and believe that the body grows and builds up into Jesus uh, when we're each contributing and we're working together in a healthy, collective, collaborative way. Um, 
the flock, this one's been, uh, we've been hitting up a lot with Psalm 23, but we've got a couple of passages. Uh, we are the sheep and he is our shepherd. So the church is a flock of sheep. Uh, a tree that we are the branches and he is the stalk and the root that we are where we get our, our life from. A building. Uh, Jesus is the, the cornerstone and the foundation and we are all built on top of him. Um, head of the church is Jesus. The church consists of those who believe in Jesus as the Messiah or the Savior. Now here's a big question. Was there a church in the Old Testament? Uh, what do you guys think? Now it's, it's only used, go ahead. Okay, so yeah, they didn't call it, they didn't use the word church. There's one reference thing using that, but that wasn't the main word. I mean, they had, they had Sabbath, so they had weekly gatherings. You had the people of God. There were troopy of God that were part of that and people who, who weren't. And so you, you see the, the church existing um, in the Old Testament, um, but before Christ came. And, and that wasn't the main word that they used. Uh, so when the New Testament comes, they, they start to, to use this new word, to diff, to word that's kind of like but not like. So there's a similar a dissimilitude and a similarity to it. Um, I, because of all of this, <laughs> this uh, when we first started the church, I didn't want to call it a church. And so, and, and I just, we wanted to reach non-believers and it's so bad, still do. But I thought, man, it would be just really sweet to have church in a bar. And, and so, like, that, <laughs> unbelievers, they'd be into that. And so I was on it, literally on a mission to find a place that we could meet in a bar. And I got, um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, it used to be a much more popular music venue in town, but not so much anymore, but Brick by Brick down the street. Anybody ever seen it? Um, and so I talked to the owner there, and he was totally cool with us um, meeting there and, and, and whatnot. But the problem was that he said that we had to card people at the door to come in. And, and Ricky at the time was like 17 or 18, I think, if any of you guys know Rick Warner, Ricky and Ashley Warner. And so I was like, crap, we can't meet there because then Ricky can't come to church anymore. But <laughs> when I was trying to talk to the owner and describing like what we were, we, didn't, we were just the resolved then. We weren't the resolved church. And, um, and so I kept trying to describe like who we were and what we were doing, but I wasn't using the word church. And, and he's like, well, so, so are you a church and, or, or not? He asked me. And I'm like, well, like, you know, yeah, but probably not like what you would think we are, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so I walked away from that, that meeting. And um, one of the guys that I planted the church originally with, he, he asked me, he's like, Dwayne, are you, are you embarrassed that, that we're a church? And I just, it was like, oh. And so I was like, from then on, we've been the resolved church. <laughs> like, we're going to be a church. We're going to redeem all this and try not to, to, um, to be everything that we don't want to be. So um, some people say that, oh, well, you know, Jesus, he just hung out with the disciples. He taught, he preached, he healed, he did these things. He never intended to start the church. That was the people that came after him that did that. Right? Have you guys ever, ever heard that? Well, Jesus, he says very clearly to Peter in Matthew 16, I tell you, you're Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church. He's very clear that his whole intention and his whole time with the disciples for three years was to prepare them to start the church. Now, some of that, 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 that oh, when it says upon this rock, you know, Peter's name was the rock, that was his confession of faith. No, no, it's, it doesn't work grammatically in the Greek. But what you actually see on the day of Pentecost, on the very first day of the first church, gets who preaches? Peter. And so it's very clear that, that Jesus is making a reference to when the church would start. And that was their understanding collectively about that. Um, Jesus fully intended to start the church. It, it uh, consists of those whom Jesus came to die for. Uh, that's what we learned when we talked about limited atonement, that Jesus took specific names to the cross, not die, to die just for a blank check. And then he promises that it will not fail, that the gates of hell will not overcome it. Um, so that's just a super fast like tour through what the, the biblical pictures of church. Um, now let's start talking and thinking through some, some things we need to understand as far as what, what it means to be the church. So um, the church, there's what we would say a, an invisible church or um, an invisible church. So invisible, if the church is all true believers throughout all time, that's a that's a collective body of people that we don't see, right? Um, God sees it um, as it's throughout all time. Visible is that there is actual some people we can be like, yeah, this is at least part of that, okay? So other way we would say that this would be a local. This would be universal. 
So universal, all people throughout all time, visible, local, physical expression. Another way to look at this is that this is the capital C church, and this is the little C church. Does that make sense? Um, now, here's the thing. You can be in a visible local church, but actually not be a true believer, a true Christian. So you're not really part of the universal church. But if you are in the invisible universal church, you will be in a physical local church. Does that make sense? So some, some people will say, have you guys ever heard this? Like, oh, I, just, I love Jesus, but I'm just not into the church. I don't go to church. I do my own church. I do church at the beach. Oh, what? No, if you love Jesus, you're going to love his bride. Like, if you come to my house and start talking crap about my wife, I'm going to kick you out. Like, Jesus loves his bride. Um, and so if you truly love Jesus, then you'll want to follow him and his expectations and desires for you to be, in a, be committed to a local visible church. Does that make sense? Um, you can be uh, in a visible local church, not in the capital C universal church, but if you are in this one, you truly believe you will want to be in a local visible church. Cool? Okay. Um, what about Israel? Um, Paul says in Romans 2 that one is a true Jew inwardly when he has the circumcision of the heart. And so true Israel, he explains in the book of Romans, are true believers. Um, in the Old Testament, that would be believers that were um, believed in a future Savior, that salvation has always been by grace through faith in the person and work of Jesus. And so they were believing in a future promise of a Savior. So if here's Old, Old Testament, they're looking this way. Now where are we? Here's us now. We look backward into the Savior that, that has come. And both people, this is the church. True Israel. So there is a question of like, what about physical Israel, you know, right now? Um, is there going to be some, um, you know, in the end times, like some number of physical blood Jews that will then convert? Maybe. The Romans 11 kind of maybe opens up that window. It's not super clear. Um, uh, there's been a lot of church groups that have gotten really uh, fascinated with the end times and trying to read into all kinds of like crazy stuff in Revelation that you just is insane, like, you know, helicopters and all this kind of stuff. But they didn't have helicopters back then, so that's that's a clear sign that that's not what it could mean because the text can never mean what it never could have meant. Um, so um, all this stuff about like Israel, you know, the geographical locale, what you actually see what happens in Jesus coming, he's, uh, when he talks to the Samaritan woman, he says a time is coming and has now come when um, true worshipers will worship neither on this mountain nor ma mountain, but worship in spirit and in truth. With Jesus coming, the geographical central locale of Israel gets then, he says, now I'm going to send you out. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, that the church no longer has any kind of physical, geographical, local um, home. Does that make sense? Um, important to understand. So we're not a church that gets all like crazy about whatever's happening in Israel all the time. Like Israel's people who believe in Jesus. <laughs> Um, the kingdom of God, um, the church, so we just, the kingdom of God, by the way, is Jesus' like favorite phrase. I mean, he's constantly talking and preaching about the kingdom. Now we did the now and not yet thing already, right? Uh, you guys remember that? So the kingdom the, the, and the overlap. Yeah. So here's where we are in the middle. So this is the kingdom that has come and this is the kingdom that will come. And we live in the time between the time, the now and the not yet. Um, so what is, the church and the kingdom are not the same thing. Um, the church really, in many ways, is the custodian of the kingdom. So what's the kingdom of God? Anybody want to take a stab at it? It's the rule and reign of the king. Rule and reign of King Jesus. So we, we spiritually live out what it looks like to have Jesus as our king right now in is the kingdom of God, but the, a lot of the physical aspects of the kingdom haven't happened yet, but will come when he, when he comes as king with all his armies of, of heaven and sets up the kingdom on earth. The church is really carrying the message. So we're 
or here, a church is carrying the message of Jesus as king, the king of the kingdom, to when he sets up the kingdom in full. I'd say the church is the custodian of kingdom. Now, this is important. Roman Catholic eschatology, eschatology is the study of end times, is actually, they, they believe that Jesus will return when everybody has been converted to Catholicism on the earth. That's their, that's their missional view, so to speak, which is pretty crazy thought. Um, um, we don't believe that because um, Jesus seems pretty clear that there are, there's a wide gate that leads to destruction. The church witnesses to the kingdom, is an instrument of the kingdom, is a custodian of the kingdom. Um, is that clear? Understand the difference between kingdom and church? Church is the believers of, of God. And so we point to the kingdom, we talk about the kingdom, we long for the kingdom, Jesus is our king. When Jesus does return then there's a f and, and justice is administered, then what will happen? Then, then the church and the kingdom will be one. Does that make sense? There'll be a uniting of them. But right now, there's still a lot of not yet of the kingdom that we are pointing to and working toward. All right. Purpose of the church. So, is the church for Christians or non-Christians? Hey, I like that. <laughs> Good answer. I mean, but that's been a huge thing that people have argued. Is, is church for the building up of the body? Or is the church supposed to reach the lost? And you actually see this play out in the way that churches do church. So some churches, it's all about, I mean, they assume so much language or Christianese, and it's just about teaching and growing up the current believers, and there's like zero missional effort to try to be involved in culture and try to reach out to people, right? Then you've got other churches that, man, it's all about reaching other people, and so we want to make every, dumb everything down, no talk of sin, death, or hell, just so we can get as many people in the door as possible. And so you see churches that go both extremes, both routes, right? Um, I think it's both. <laughs> Actually, I think church, first and foremost, we need to, to recognize exists for God. Like, same thing back to the Imago Dei. God created us. We exist for him, for his praise and his glory. First and foremost, we need to say that, that the church exists for God to bring him glory. Now, I think if we, if we have that as our view, then what it means is, okay, we want to go out and bring as many people into there because there's still worshipers that haven't found the joy of worshiping God in full yet and seeing his glory. So they're really one and the same. We, we want to both be built up and bring other people in to be built up too because we want to give glory to God. Um, cool. This is helpful. Um, so we strive for unity. Um, there's so much of all of this stuff. I mean, churches, I mean... How many people in here have been part of another church and it wasn't a good experience? Me, me, one, two, three, so about half the room. That's, that's pretty fair. I mean, sometimes it's even more that church is a place where you get hurt. So you're like, why would I want to do that again? Like, like church, sometimes Christians and people in church can be really, really mean and cruel, you know? Um, so, so many times there's fighting. You have Paul talking to you, I mean, Poor Yoda and Syntyche. Like they're only these these two gals. They get mentioned in the Bible, and they're they're publicly great. He's like Yoda and Syntyche. I urge you to get along in the Lord. <laughs> they're like fighting. <laughs> like yeah, I got my name in a file because I couldn't get along with people in church. <laughs> like poor Yoda and Syntyche. <laughs> um, but we're to strive for unity. Now there's a cultural um, unity. Um, when we first plan the church, I remember the, the reader interviewed me, San Diego reader, and they're like, okay, so like, who's the people you're trying to reach, you know, like, because they had a demographic approach. So a lot of people's idea of church is that you, you know, so you, f you find a target people, your demographic, and then you try to tailor everything you do to meet that demographic. And uh, does that make sense? Do you guys understand that business philosophy principle? Um, and so when they asked me, like, what's your target demographic? And I said, every tribe and tongue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because that's the language that you have in Revelation is the picture of the church. It says that every tribe and tongue is worshiping together. And I believe that God actually means for multi-ethnic, multi-generational church people to be church together. You've got the whole book of Romans. And yes, it's the clearest art articulation of the gospel that we have in the Bible as far as like getting into the nuts and bolts theology of it. But all throughout it, there's this thread, Jews and Gentiles. It's the power of the gospel and of salvation, both for Jews and for the Greek. Jews and Gentiles get along in the Lord. It's, it's constantly, hey, I mean, these are like 
two different like people groups, I, I mean, extremely racist people groups. And he's like, figure it out. Get along. Jesus died for both of you. Um, and I think, man, like looking at, um, I didn't plan to talk about this, but like all stuff in our country with uh, Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter and all that, man, it's, it's, that's, what, that's what we're seeing. We need, we need multicultural, multi-ethnic diversity. Make sense? Uh, that's what Jesus calls us to. Um, there's a doctrinal unity um, that, that we, we circle around, and so that's why we do this class. That's where we, our unity grows when we are, the more that we are of one heart and one mind. Um, then we're able to actually commit to one. I mean, you think about a marriage. A healthy marriage has a man and woman that, that they agree on things, um, and so they're able to get along. Reasons for disunity. So, um, Churches do end up corrupt. Character and or beliefs of the leaders of the church is contrary to scripture. And so if you've got, if you've got a, if you're part of a church that clearly believes something that the Bible doesn't, that goes against what the Bible clearly says, it's not a good church to be a part of, right? Um, also, if you've got a church with leaders who are disqualified. So in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, you've got like, 16 different qualifications that the pastors must meet. 15 of them are character. There's one on doctrine about them having their right theology. All the rest are character. Um, so you've got corrupt leaders that are disqualified. You, you, if you can't trust the leaders, you can't trust the church. Make sense? Um, so that's part of what we're, when, you know, if you're becoming a member of the church, we're committing to be those kind of men for you that meet those qualifications. We've committed to God, we've committed to one another, and we commit to the church body, and every time we have new members come in, we renew those commitments that we will be those kind of men. Um, and then if we're not, that we pray that you would lovingly rebuke us and kick us out. So um, if you ever find me in embezzling money, if you ever find me having any kind of affair, emotional or physical, with another woman, um, please fire me. <laughs> and demand that the other pastors fire me. Uh, make sense? Cool. Um, corrupt individual. Um, all right, so we've got to talk about church discipline, which isn't fun. But um, So church is a group of sinners, right? So what do you think happens when you've got a group of people committing to one another to be the church? We sin. <laughs> sin against God, we sin against one another. Jesus has given us a very clear process in how to deal with that. He expects that it's going to be the reality. So here's what, here's what Jesus says. I want to read it um, straight from the word so you, can, so you can see it. So Jesus says, if your brother or sister, so that's gender inclusive, sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, the leaders of the church. And if he refuses this and listen to the church, then let him be to you a Gentile and a tax collector. And I tell you whatever you agree about, God's behind basically and all that. Um, and then he says, wherever two or three have gathered in my name, um, I'm among them. Um, that, that doesn't mean, like, people use, have anybody ever heard that verse? Oh, two or three of God, Jesus' presence is in I'm like, you're talking about, you're about to kick somebody out of the church? <laughs> like, that's what, the, that's what the passage is, that Jesus has his, 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 the authority of his presence condoning the excommunication. <laughs> um, okay. So the process, this four-step process. You go to them one-on-one -on -one alone. Try to win them over. And you do it gently. Well, that's what Galatians 6, 1 says, that you who are spiritual attempt to restore a person gently, lest you too fall. You know, and Jesus talked about that one. Judge not lest you be judged, you know, because, it, because you got a plank in your own eye. you got to do it gently, recognizing your own propensity, your own faults and failures. You do it, you speak the truth, Ephesians 4 says, when you're going to a, because any sin is where truth has gone somehow in some way. You speak the truth in love loving it's gracious it's not dude you did this and you're wrong and you need to change oh my gosh dude like gotta go and address the heart um you go first one-on-one -on -one alone they don't listen then you try to you know bring another person in 
to be like, hey, can we talk to you together? Like, it just doesn't seem like we talked about this and they're not changing. If they don't listen then, then you go tell the pastor. So many times people come to me, dude, so-and-so, da, da, da. I'm like, did you go talk to them? And they're like, just you and them alone? They're like, no. I'm like, well, why are you talking to me? I'm like two steps more down the road. Like, don't come to me with it yet. Um, make sense? Then the saddest one is step four, whereas if you've gone to someone repeatedly, um, tried to address something and you don't see change, and you're like, we, you got to leave. And, and sadly, um, and, and just so you know, we're a church that does practice this. It's painful. Um, it doesn't happen that often, but the, um, the purity of the church is at stake. We've got to protect the border. Um, so, for example, we've had to ask, I remember there was a girl, man, she, a few years ago, she was so great in hospital, one of the most bubbly people, you know, um, and, you know, I baptized her and her, her boyfriend at the time. Um, they broke up, and she lived with a couple of girls in, in the church, and um, she started dating this unbeliever and started sleeping with um, and so the girls in her house tried to talk to her. One of the girls tried to talk to her about it. She didn't listen. She, then they brought a couple of the girls, sat her down. She still didn't listen. And so we had to um, tell her she, couldn't come, she, couldn't, she wasn't welcome to, to be a part of our church. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, I believe it's 10. I have to double check on that. Maybe it's 11. No, it's not 11 because that's the communion passage. I think it's 10. Um, it says that there's a guy in the church that was um, having sex with his stepmom. And, and he went quit. Uh, that they're talking about. And so he says, dude, purge the evil person. My mom says, don't even eat with them. Um, I mean, that's what they lived out in, in Corinthians. So we had to do that. So those girls, they refused to even eat with the girl anymore and, and asked her to leave the church. And eventually they actually, actually asked her to leave the house. Uh, purity of the church is at stake. We had to do it over drunkenness. Had to do it over drugs. Man, I had this guy, he, he served in AV for a couple years and it came out that, um, <laughs> such a sad, he was just completely addicted to smoking weed like every day for his sanity. He was studying for the bar and he was so stressed out. He was always smoking weed to study, but then he couldn't go in high and take the bar and so he'd failed twice. And, um, and we tried to help him, try to talk to him. He hadn't taken communion in almost two years because he felt so guilt-stricken about it. And I was like, dude, please stop, let us help you. And he was like, I was like, are you willing? Are you willing to, to try and to stop? And he said, no. And so I was like, well, then we have to ask you to leave. Like, I was like, please, brother, don't do this. And I, and I remember I was just crying, and he just gave me a hug. And that was the last time I talked to him, you know? Like, we'll protect the purity of the church. It matters. Um, so it sucks. <laughs> um, but, yeah, got to do it. So any questions about that? Church discipline sucks. Yeah. So, so where is... What status do you have to be at to incur church discipline? Because you have non-believers who are totally jacked up totally. coming in here. Yeah. Do you have to just profess Christ and then you get treated like a member? Yeah. Or is it membership? That's, that's why we do this, you know. Yeah. I mean, I we believe that membership is the way of covenant to one another. You have lists that are kept in the New Testament. That's why we believe in, because, you know, if we're preaching to such a wide range of people, like and Hebrews 13 says, I have to stand before Jesus and give an account for those people. I got to know who I'm responsible for, so I because I don't want to get in trouble, <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, that's why we do this. So the the bar goes way up once you're a covenanted, committed member. So um, same principles would apply, I think, of any person that's on mission and just being loving. But man, dude, my friend I surfed with the other day that's told me he's like snorting Ritalin and all kinds of stuff or whatever. I'm like, dude, I don't need to talk to him about that. My main thing with him is I just want to introduce him to Jesus and because that's when that stuff will get all cleaned up. The problem's not that he's snorting coke. Um, he said he was going to come this Sunday, but he didn't show up. But anyway, I asked for the prayer people before. So I said, I want to pray for my coke dealer friend that's supposed to be coming. And I was like, uh, I was like, not my coke dealer. I'm like, my, my coke dealer's not ready to come yet. Like, um, but uh Man, so I'm going to grant them tons of grace. Sure. But you're a member. You say you love Jesus and you're walking in his ways and you're snorting coke. Dude, we got an issue. Now we got to talk about this because you're not living in line with the gospel. Right. Yeah. What about that middle ground, though, with like the person who came here as an unbeliever, got saved two weeks ago? Totally. And, you know... It's a great area. I think you want to be you want to be sensitive, you know. Um, I think the same 
principle of speaking the truth in love and doing things with gentleness applies, there's just not as much at stake, you know. And so I think you you want to you want to be sensitive. Like, is this the right time to bring this up? Everything's usually happening, no matter what the sin is. Is it's really there's something else going on that's driving it. Too often we think about sin as it's you breaking this list of rules and do's and don'ts. No, 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 no. Like, what's going on that's driving you? toward this like sin always jesus says matthew 15 comes out of the heart he says out of the heart that comes um, lies murder adultery all of that so too often we talk about the lie or the murder or the adultery instead of what's going on in your heart you know and so that's the way that you know and, and so i think yeah that same principle applies it's just if you're a member there's more at stake um, so yeah, great question yeah april Well, following this, these steps from Jesus, it would, never, um, it would never come to us unless there were already at least two people in the church that were solid that brought it to our attention. So we would see that there was a unity there. But then also, yes, that's one of the, the things that you're trusting the leaders of the church to do is to make the right call in the end. Um, but we, as a principle, and we're going to get to this in a minute, the way that we operate as a, a church leadership is that we seek the input intuition and counsel of the bride like a wise husband does with his wife so yeah in the end we make the decision but we don't make any big decisions with really out with without seeking wisdom from um, the people in the church it's the difference between a view a voice and a vote so we give you a view give you a voice but when it comes down to it that's the elders that have the vote Totally. Their flaws. Right. So, like, how do you distinct, like, how do you make that kind of distinction in your head where it's like, it's grace versus rules? Right. It's like, this has always been yeah. a problem. You know, so, like, right. because like, like, I go over to, like, if you're willing gluttony, you know, like, you are overeating, you should not be eating uh-huh. these donuts, you're like, you know, this, that's a sin, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I like, Yeah, yeah, but I I just think things get so like overloaded when we're like, um, it's like sin and you're doing the wrong thing, you know, and that's where the Pharisee thing comes through with that attitude because it's not addressing the heart. So, so you bring up gluttony is a perfect one. So, I he's I think he'd be okay with me saying this because yeah he was talking to a bunch of other people about it so it's fine. But so Nick Todd, the leader of the band today, we were up on the way to men's retreat and. I just noticed, like, he was getting, like, bigger and bigger. Like, he was getting, like, pretty big. And so I, we were, like, in the truck, right? I'm like, dude, you're the, you feel like I'm, like, kind of bigly. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, what's going on? He's like, oh, I'm just, like, eat, been eating terrible and stuff. And I'm like, dude, you need to, like, take care of your body. Like, you need to work out, you know? And he's like, yeah. And so he got back. I'm like, Nick, I just love it. When he goes something, he, <laughs> you worked out with him, right? He's like, go, tell, tell us how hardcore he is now. Okay. okay. So Nick, Nick Todd's a guy that when he gets focused on something, he gets focused. Yeah. Um, I mean, with his house, everything, right? I mean, mm-hmm. point any, any direction of his life. And uh, he got back from, from men's retreat, and uh, he's on a 16-week program and has missed probably four days. Uh, he's on the second half of it, but he was, uh, I mean. And he's lost, I think, like 35 pounds. He's lost it. And not, not just the weight <laughs> that he, I don't know if you guys, like, I have a before and after shot because I met him, like, right before he started yeah. his, 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 um, uh, his, I guess, cleanse, you know, <laughs> of, uh, of his uh, bad ways. But, man, he was, he was kind of a big guy. Yeah. Like, fat. <laughs> flat out was. He wouldn't mind me saying that. He, no, yeah. He's he's kind of getting ripped right now. It's pretty awesome. To, yeah. To, he's just he stands. He's actually I think an inch taller. Yeah. Just because the way he stands. Yeah. He, he looks great and feels great. Yeah. yeah and he, he has a he has a medical condition that. Yeah. Prohibits him from doing certain stuff. So. Yeah. yeah. So that was all out of just a, a gentle loving conversation really about gluttony. Yes. Like, make that person, uh, like, you're better than right. you see that. Okay. 
Yeah, because I think so often the unloving confrontation is more about trying to make me feel better about myself instead of be like, hey, dude, I've got my own, I got my own like ugly bag and stuff that I'm working on and faults and failures. You know, we don't see it. It's, church isn't a competition to see who can get to the top of the hill first. You know, we're the ones that are trying to help each other up. And so I think when we have that, like, yeah, I love how you said that, the long-term view, you're actually caring about the, the person, like, and their, and, and their well-being. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm, like, concerned for you, dude, because it's kind of not healthy. Like, that's a, I'm just loving the person. I'm not like, dude, I didn't, I didn't say to Nick, I don't think I brought up a verse. You know, I could have brought up a proverb, no, this is gluttony, it's a sin of gluttony, you know, but, like, I'm just like, dude, like, you seem like you've gotten big, and that's not good. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, being loving to people isn't that hard, <laughs> and people receive it a lot better. But I was like, dude, I need to talk to you about something that I've been concerned about, you know, because Proverbs blah, 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 says that gluttony is a sin, and I've been noticing that you've been eating a lot, and you look kind of fat. You think, how, how's a person respond to that? Yeah. So, great. All right. We got to move on. <laughs> Nick, we love you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I got kind of off there, so I'm trying to find my spot here again. Um, so that was church discipline. Conscience, this one's tough. Like, um, sometimes you're like, oh, I'm just not feeling it or whatever. That's so tough, you know, when people are like, oh, I'm going to leave the church or, I just, or I'm or they're thinking about coming and they're just like, whether I feel it or not. Like, like we're talking about today, feelings can be deceiving. We need to think. And so actually one of your appendixes that you can read is picking and leaving a church. Like how do you pick a good church? Because there's a decision that asks me, and certain factors have to go in that. And then how do you leave and how you know it's time to leave and how do you leave well? Um, feelings is, is tough. I say to a lot of people, like if you commit to three months, like coming every Sunday, you commit to community for three months, 95% of the time you're probably going to find friends for life. But if you're like kind of in and out, you don't really engage anyone, you never really, really get in community, you're just going to kind of feel the, and then probably won't stick. Like people stick when they get in relationship. Um, methodology, so this is the other one where people like, most of the times people say why they like um, pick a church. Oh, the music was great, the preaching was wonderful, and they have all these great programs. That's um, a pretty shoddy list, so you want has solid doctrine, it, um, it has solid community, has a place for you to use your gifts and to contribute and who you are and to be a part, a member. So you, God's list often looks a lot different than what our popular culture lists are. When someone does leave, um, it's true that there are times for separating. Even Paul and Barnabas, two apostles, this is they got in Acts 16, there was a point when they got in a sharp disagreement. You know what their argument was about? Whether John Mark was going to go on a missionary trip with them. <laughs> and Paul thought... Or Barnabas thought the shade was taken, and Paul thought no, and it got so bad, they had to, Paul and Barnabas had to split up. And it says, yet they commended each other in the grace of the Lord. So if somebody has to leave, I mean, they're, like, and sometimes it's just work or, you know, whatever. Like, you, you know, you change jobs and you got to leave. You know, sometimes it's something harder. We want to do things in a gracious and loving way and, and part with blessing. Um, one of the sad things I think what we've seen because of not living this out and doing this well in Christian history is we have so many denominations. I mean, there are so many denominations that there. I've got a whole book, like a handbook of denominations, like a few hundred. <laughs> it's crazy throughout history. Um, really, I think when there is something that is um, in error that we're trying to redeem, the reform is the right word. So reformation, sometimes people say semper reformanda, that we should always be reforming. We're always trying to progress in our sanctification, both you know, becoming more like Christ, both in our individual lives and as a church. Um, separatism, um, that happens when you're just like, I can't stand this, I'm leaving, I'm going to go start something else. That's the bad reason to start a church or to start any kind of thing out of anger. You know, um, I had a lot of mixed, God had to really purify my desire for um, planting this church when we first started it because when people would ask like, okay, well, who are you and what are you about? I'm like, well, we're not this, we're not this, we're not that. <laughs> okay, well, what are you? I don't know, but we're just not this or that, 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 you know? It's really easy, like you were saying, to criticize and deconstruct something. It's really hard to actually construct something, um, to build something. Um, parachurch organizations, um, 
So you, might, you guys know what a parachurch organization uh, is? You want to give us a little they're example and ex explanation? Um, well, they're groups that are set up and maybe, you know, they have, like, the gospel as part of their vision statement. So mm -hmm. they have a specific trajectory or mission in mind or it's like, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, we're a Christian counseling, so we're not a church, but we do, we specialize in one thing or another. Right. Or like homeless ministry or arts ministry, stuff like that. Yeah. So there's some good parachurch organizations. There's some that are really challenging because sometimes people get in, they either come to Christ through these organizations or they get involved in them, but they demand so much of their gifting and their time that they actually can't really be a part of a church. But, well, went back to if you love Jesus, you love his church and be involved in one of his churches. Um, and then sometimes it gets really ugly when they're wanting the people to give their money to the parachurch organization. Um, so sometimes there's a bad rub there. Now, not all parachurch organizations are bad. We're part of a parachurch organization, Acts 29, there where we partner together in planting churches and under a certain doctrinal statement. Um, you know, we started the San Diego church planting thing. That's a parachurch organization. So it's not, it's, it, it, it's not always bad. A lot of the times it can be really challenging. It's frustrating. Um, all right, gifts of the church. Um, everyone has been given gifts by God. Now, obviously the gift of salvation um, if you're a Christian, um, but he's also giving you things like you have a unique fingerprint, you have unique talents. Like Mike's a very gifted and talented musician, and comes from a family of talented musicians. You know that's a gift of God. One of the one of the um, I think big growth points for us as as Christians is to figure out what our gifts are and to put them to use. Um, because if you're not contributing um, then and, and using your gifts, there's something that I don't know, you want to share about that? Like, you've told that to me before when you're like, I'm not playing music, I just feel like hollow and incomplete. You've, you've said stuff like that, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know if I could articulate it well, like off the cuff, but yeah, um, yeah I think God, yeah, throughout your life, if you look back, like, He gives you desires, He gives you things you, you like to do and things you're good at, and those things bring, you know, enjoyment and satisfaction to you. And so I find, like, I've, I've played in bands outside of church, you know, playing gigs around town all the time with a a band full of non-believers, and though it's super fun, it's not ultimately fulfilling in the way that, like, serving the church is. Like, I've got a heart, like, to serve the congregation and the musicians I play with, and there's a, a joy that, that I receive, like, from giving in that mm -hmm. context that you don't get when you're doing it for yourself. Like, like I can't go home and just play guitar, and, and it's not like, oh, wow, this is feeding me. You know, it's feeding mm -hmm. me when I'm here on a Sunday with people or putting in practice time with people. So I feel that um, yeah, God gives you these things and, and you know, wants you to be good at them and wants you to, to share them with people and, and hope that other people enjoy those things and find those same kind of gifts. Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Mike. Now, sometimes it takes trial and error. You gotta try a few different things, you know? Or sometimes maybe there's like, you know, we've got like 16 different ministries, I think it is, that you can be a part of and contribute in, but maybe there's one that we don't have, you know? We, we, our desire is to help you discover your gifts and to use your gift. So if there's a ministry you might have in mind that you would like to do, but our church doesn't have it. We've got a process for that. You know, first ask you to pray about it, talk to some other people, look for some confirmation, then write up a proposal that gets submitted to the elders, and then we walk through that and see if it's something that we can get going and start in the church. I mean, a lot of the ministries that we have have been started that way uh, because the people had an idea of something that we didn't currently have. So sometimes people are looking for church, they're like, oh, well, you have this or that. Well, well we don't, but maybe you're the one to help us have that and create that. Make sense? Um, there's a... There's a li you can see in your book, there's kind of a list of all the, the gifts um, in the Bible there and the way that they get described, um, and they can get played out in a number of different ways. Um, I want to talk just a minute about um, gender. I believe like our gender is a gift from God, that he created us male and female, and that those two things are different, and that the differences are to be celebrated and to be complementary to one another, to contribute to one another. Um, so much in our culture just seems to want to androgenize us, um, so everybody's the same, um, where sex doesn't matter. Um, your physical, physiological makeup as a human person says something, not, it says something about who God's made you internally and emotionally and spiritually. I mean, it's just a fact that men and women are different. Not just physically, but in the way that they operate. I mean, there's tons of studies that, you know, 
in general, um, females have a greater desire to feel loved and, and adored and to be cared for. Um, and that guys, males, have a greater desire and need and tendency to be respected and to be honored. And it just, that's just the way that our makeup is psychologically. And that those are good things. It's good that we're different and they're meant to complement one another. And so we are a, we're a church that upholds um, gender, um, gender roles, gender differences in terms both of um, male and, and females in, in the home. So scripture uh, clearly teaches that the man is meant to be the head or the leader of the home and that the, the wife or the woman is meant to be the helper. So head and help, that a good wife helps her husband and they join together in their, in their differences. But that, that male leadership is the way that God intends, um, intends things to function. Now, I know, I know that there's been um, a lot of what happens is a male in a leadership role, whether it's with a woman or in a church, he'll go one of two um, directions at, at times. Um, he'll either... He'll either um, abuse or abdicate his role. So in abuse, he's harsh. He uses his authority role to be mean and cruel, and, and sometimes ver verbally, for sure, and then sometimes, in the worst cases, physically. So you think of if you um, had a father who beat you. Um, he, was, that's, he abused his role of authority. Now you've got other guys that go a different route. I think guys tend to one of these extremes, but they just abdicate. They're like, well, oh, I just want to be a good guy. I'm trying to be loving. So they don't step into that role of leadership. Um, and then, so then the woman feels um, unsafe and insecure and is scared. Now, I even, so I think most of the times when we hear, oh, head and help, and that the man's meant to be the leader and the woman's meant to be the helper, there's like this, you know, no. um, most of the time when there's like, hard reaction to that, it's because the, the person has experienced that and it's had deep, harmful effects in their soul. Um, but even in those worst cases, I have yet to find a, a, a gal, and they say, don't you just want to be loved and protected for and provided for and cared for by a man? And she's like, no, I don't want that. Like, no. That's the deepest desires of our heart. Um, and so we believe that, um, you know, male and female are meant to be distinct and that they are meant to be together and they're meant to complement one another. My wife is my greatest asset as a man and in ministry. She helps me far more than I could ever describe. She encourages me. She's, I'm way more book smart, but she's way more like people smart and in her intuition, like a wise husband seeks the input, intuition, and counsel of his wife. That's why God's given her to him. So you never really make, yeah, in the end he makes the call, but man, it, like you do it together. Um, and that also has implications for the LBGTQ agenda, you know, we're trying to, again, attempt to androgenize and not recognize the need for differences and that those are meant to complement one another. So any questions on that? Okay. Um, same principle when it comes to leadership in the church. Um, so we don't have any female pastors. Because um, the Bible says in the book of 1 Timothy, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man in the church. Um, well, and in the home. Uh, but the church, basically, church leadership is based upon home leadership. So in many ways, the home is, is like, so if we've got capital C church, then we've got lowercase c church, then we've got like an even lowercase c church, and that's the home. <laughs> so if you walk through the qualifications, basically, it's like, you know, Good dads make good pastors. Like that's the whole the whole family structure. Even like one of the qualifications for a guy to be a pastor is that he's able to manage his household well, and his children are submissive. Um, so they go hand in hand. So that's the same principle that we practice. Uh, we have multiple pastors. Um, no, I don't. Even though you guys hear from me more from the pulpit and whatnot, I don't have any more authority than the other pastors. Um, so we always attempt at having unanimous agreement on any big decision that we make. And if we're not united yet, then we wait to make the decision and pray more until we can get to unity. Um, we have member meetings three times a year, which we uh, expect you to come at, love to have you at, because then we're like, hey, here's some things that we're thinking through. There's mics. We're like, what do you think? We want your input. Speak, bride. And that's how we make decisions in the church. We try to, we try to operate that way together. Um, 
that's our church government. It's called plural um, elder government, if you want the technical term for it. Uh, it's very different than uh, the a pa- a Catholic or Episcopal model of church government. is is from the top down. So you've got a pope, and then you've got the um, the bishops and and the priests and on down. So um, the other model. So you've got I'm out of space here. So you've got Catholic model. Um, uh, which is called the Episcopal or Episcopal model of of, of church government. Um, the other ones, so that one's like top down. You've got this other one that is called congregational, and it's from the bottom up. So it's where all the the church members are the ones that really hold the key. So nothing's a decision. A lot of Baptist churches are like this are made unless all the, it's majority vote on everything, uh, any direction of the church and the whatever the the members say. Uh, the problem with this one is that a lot of times good pastors get fired <laughs> because the congregation didn't like what they're hearing. You know, uh, what's that? Southern Baptist. Yeah, it's not a lot of Southern Baptists. Uh, yeah, the, you've been a part where it's like that. From Louisiana. Yeah, so you've, you've seen, seen that. Of them, seen a lot of pastors fired for yeah. odd reasons. Yeah. Stuff. Like, seriously, one one Sunday you preached the wrong thing, you might be gone. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Just because someone got their, their feelings hurt. Yeah. Presbyterian form of government is a little bit uh, just kind of a mix of the two to oversimplify it. But um, so we're, I, I think we're kind of actually in the middle <laughs> because with our give the bride a view of voice but not a vote. So there's, there's leadership and authority, but it's not like you don't have uh, a place at the table to say anything. That makes sense? Okay. You have a confused look on your face, April. Are you okay? <laughs> just making sure. Great question. Great question. Um, so Acts 29, sometimes people are like, is it a denomination or is it not? Well, it is and it isn't. I think it's kind of all the good stuff in denomination without the bad stuff. <laughs> um, there's a very um, high bar of a doctrinal agreement that we have to have to be a part of Acts 29. There's an approval process of the lead pastors. Um, it's a network of churches that agree together under that banner for planting churches. Um, however, every every Local church, every little C church, is individually autonomous in their leadership. So we ha- we have our own 501c3. Acts 29 doesn't have any uh, own any property. They don't have. They're not mixed up in our books at all, um, and they don't have the authority to fire any of our pastors. Uh, the most thing that they could do is if we started believing something wacky that went outside of Acts 29's uh, doctrinal statement, they could say you can't be Acts 29 anymore. Um, which which happens, and I actually, just so you know, I'm the area lead for Acts 29 for all of San Diego. So we've got um, seven churches in San Diego that are Acts 29, and so I'm I'm responsible for all of them to my direct overseer. Um, so does that does that answer your question? Okay. Is that mainly for the network capability, like networking capabilities? Is that kind of the, the point to? Right, you know, and like, I mean, we're, we, we want to plant as many churches as possible. So, yeah, we sent out servant church this last year. We actually had a daughter church, but we're also supporting eight planters financially through Acts 29. Um, and so that's when we do the mission report. A lot of times we'll bring one up on the screen and be like, hey, so because 10% of all our monies that come in is set aside for um, church planting. And so a lot of times people come like, oh, what about this or what about that? All, 100% of our mission budget is for church planning. So we don't support anything but church planning. So a lot of times people are like, can you give me this? Can you give me that? No. Like, it all goes to our church planning. So, yeah. I'm going to skip that. You hear it all the time. No head or senior pastor but Jesus. I say it every sermon. <laughs> so, I'm not going to go through, like, personal means down there. That's just, like, what it looks like to be a Christian and, and live out the faith. Um, I, and I'm not going to necessarily go through um, all of the uh, the means of the church and just hit the two, a few of them because we're at, at, out of time. But we expect you to be regular on Sundays. <laughs> um, now, please go on vacation. And if you're sick, please don't come infect all of us. Um, <laughs> that's okay. But for the most part, yeah, like it shouldn't be like, oh, do I feel like going to church today? Um, no, like you're you're committing to be regular on Sundays to the best of your ability. You know that's, um, and this isn't a new problem. Hebrews ten twenty five says, "Don't forsake the habit the habit 
of getting of gathering together as some get in the habit of doing. <laughs> you know, um, expect you to be a part of a community group. You see the church regularly gathering together to get to know one another. And so the way that we look at community groups. Um, and, and it might be like a ministry. We, we think Sunday morning or, or evening or whatever Sunday and one other thing during the week. Beyond that, you need time to live life, to, you know, date your wife if you're married or to go on dates to find a spouse um, and then to have friendships with non-believers just to enjoy life and God's creation. So sometimes you get a part of church and like you have something every day. <laughs> Not healthy. Um, so we have community groups all throughout the city. You hear it all the time. But the way that we look at it is this. On Sunday, we work really hard to preach the word. Um, so that you're, you're hearing sound doctrine that, and engaging your mind. Community groups are a place where we process the word. Uh, and so community groups are designed for discussion. So everyone meets a meal because there's something in that. Jesus is always eating meals, um, you know, and it's, there's an intimacy involved in that. You really get to know people. All, all the community groups, most of them, follow do sermon discussion. So there's discussion questions about the sermon. You talk, hey, so what are you thinking? How, how is this working out in your life? Or what are you working through? At times, a, a community group will go through a specific book or whatever if God's just doing something unique, so they have the freedom to do that. But that's our expectation. It's not, I mean, in a lot of ways, I think we're just a simple church, you know? We preach the word, and then we process the word in the week as we get to know one another because we need each other to be able to become more like Jesus. Um, we always have Lord's Supper, prayer, singing, instruction in God's word, giving of money. Um, I'm going to hit this one, and then... Um, I, I don't always like talking about money, although Jesus talked about money a lot. But part of what you're committing to and becoming a member of the church is um, budgeting part of your finances uh, to regularly go to the church. So 1 Corinthians 9 says it'd be some, it should be some percentage, essentially, that is, it says that you prepare your gift beforehand. So sometimes in your church, it's like this, have you ever been in a service where it's like this manipulative thing trying to get you to give? And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa no, it, sh- it shouldn't be something that you're having to be emotionally persuaded toward. Um, it's supposed to be one of a normal discipline. The, the word that the Bible uses for is first fruits. Um, and so back, you know, when there was time periods when they didn't use coin and money, uh, you know, a lot of times it would be, hey, I'm going to bring, you know, I just had a harvest of a crop of apples and I'm going to bring, you know, 10% of my first crop of apples and come and give it to the church, you know? So that's where that term comes from. But it's meant to be off the top. Sometimes people are like, oh, if I have anything left at the end of the month, I'll give. That's actually like a really bad way of, of doing it. It should, be, it should be first. Like, because the reason why it's first is because everything ultimately comes from God. And so it's a recognition, first and foremost, that everything good, every good and perfect gift, James 1 says, comes from God above. And so I want to acknowledge that. Um, and the way that works, you're like, okay, you should set a budget that's, don't be crazy, you know, like some people really harp on the 10%. You actually only have tithe in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, and the New Testament doesn't use the word tithe. It just says cheerful giving. It doesn't even say, like, sometimes it may be more. If God's giving you great means and you can give more, you should give more, you know. If you, if you, don't, you can't give 10%, that's okay, just give something, you know, and do it regularly. We would much rather, um, and, and part of the reason we do that is like, yeah, we have needs like building and staff, but also we, I mean, last month there was a guy, I mean, he lost his job and was trying to get a new job and, and got one, but it hadn't started. He had this gap and he had like $500 and was going to make his rent. And so we paid his rent. Like we're called to come here about the poor among us is what First Thessalonians 5 says. You know, you have, we have a huge homeless population that's always asking for a handout. And then sometimes people are like, oh, we need to like care for the poor. No, that's mercy. That's mercy. We have a mercy ministry. We do that. We feed them. We try to reach out to them. And we do help them occasionally in very select cases financially. But in, in general, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, caring for the poor is the poor among the church. It's caring for one another. Um, all right. Enough on money. Only other thing Jesus said, if we love them, we'd be baptized in water. And so if you're being a member, we want all members to be baptized. So, and then using your gifts, getting involved in some ministry or starting one. All right. Five over, but we didn't do talk, table talk. Yeah. I have a yeah. Uh, elder and deacons. Yeah. I didn't hit deacons. Yeah, I went fast over it. Yeah. Um, so the current, yeah, the um, current um, elders right now are myself, James Martin, Dan Calvert, and Ryan Buss, and then Dave Maddox and Dennis Fry are in candidate phase. So they're 
currently coming to our elder meetings where, you know, the Bible says to test and approve God's will. And so we're like, okay, we're having a good sense about these guys. They've, they've had a real thorough examination with their spouse and we felt good about that. So we move forward like, okay, let's start acting like you were one of the elders and see how that goes. And so by the, na- by the time we put a name on it, it's like obvious to everyone that they've already been functioning like that. Uh, and so far, like, how do you guys feel about Dennis and Dave? Pretty good, huh? You're like, yeah, those guys are pastors, <laughs> right? Um, right now, the current deacons um, are Warren Duthie, J.C. Agajanian, uh, Nick Todd, Gabe Hagstrom. Um, I'm forgetting some. Uh, I have to pull this up. Uh, we've got a couple other deacons that are in candidate phase, Ryan Leach, Rick Warner, and Ashley Warner. So uh, we're okay with female deaconesses. Um, so that's not a, not an issue for us. And... Did you find that earlier? Uh, I don't know where you mentioned where deacon, where past the deacon, pastor. What's that? Deacon, pastor. Elder. Right. So, oh, yeah, I, I didn't say that. So the general... Um, the general, and this is an oversimplification, is that elders, and we use the word elders and pastors interchangeably because the New Testament does, um, generally lead with, um, uh, with their words, um, and deacons generally lead with their works. Okay, so, um, you know, deacons tend to do more of hands-on activity type stuff. Elders are much more involved in um, preaching, teaching, counseling, and whatnot. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm feeling like I forgot a deacon. So Carson! That's what I knew. I forgot one. It takes care of all of our church finances and whatnot. So, yeah. And he does it for a job, so it's kind of nice. So, he's a whiz at it. Great question. So, that's an oversimplification, but in general, that's. And do um, elders. Both ways. Both ways. Yeah, and some of that's in a little bit flux like because we're redoing some of our leadership development stuff. But um, there's guys, I think, I think from even down to the level of trying to introduce someone to Jesus, you want to cast vision for people's lives. Like, you're like, man, I could see you being this and doing this, you know? And that's just really, sometimes you got to help cast vision for people's lives and help them out. So I think there's sometimes there's guys have been like, dude, I really, I mean, there's one of the guys in our church, like, I don't know, I could be wrong, but Sean Keefe, I'm like, dude, you're so going to be a pastor one day. I just see it all over you, you know? Um, there's other, uh, other guys, though, like in First Timothy 3, it says those who aspire to the office of elder, they desire a noble thing. So then there's an aspiration and a pursuit. So I think it, it can come both ways. It can be um, inspired and it can be aspired. So it can be inspired by someone else. It's like, hey, you should think about this. Um, it can be aspired when you're like, hey, I really think that God is calling me in my gifting and calling, like trying to figure out my gifting and calling is to be a pastor. I mean, great, let's figure that out with you together. 